Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I got to tell you, after watching that video, Robert, I'm ready to move from Peoria to St. Pete. My goodness, Let's that was it. incredible. <laughs> Let's go. Guys, thank you again for joining us. My name is Isaac Bennett. I am the brand new partner in charge of Investor Relations. It is a huge honor to be here tonight. We are joined by Adam Beckstedt, VP of Acquisitions. Adam, say hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Thank you for joining us. We are also joined by Nate Ayala, although you can't see him on the screen right now. He is our awesome GC on this project from Finish Line Builders. We're thrilled to have him on here tonight. He'll be available for your questions, which we're super excited to expose him to you, as I think many of you had questions about Nate. So we'll have him on later. And of course, we have Robert Ritzenthaler, the man in the middle, the founder and CEO of REM. Robert, say hi. Good to be here. Thank you, Isaac, for uh, taking over the estimable uh, MC job. Appreciate that. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's Nate. Nate. Hi, Nate. Hey, how you guys doing? We're Good doing great. You, Thanks so much for joining us. Same. Yeah. And actually, you know, you mentioned uh, brand new, I guess brand new in some sense, but actually Isaac and I, I, we've been working together now for, gosh, probably a year and a half, two years, something like that. It's been a while. So. Yeah, that, that's right, Robert. I like to say that I was a consumer of this product before I was a seller of this product. So absolutely, yeah, we've got uh, millions of dollars invested with REM on the as an investor, as an LP. So um, this is something that we believe deeply in with our own money. And I think that's really important to talk about. Thanks for bringing that up, Robert. I appreciate that. Absolutely. We got some history there. Yeah, good, good history, good history. I mean, so far. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, guys, tonight uh, we're talking about our phenomenal St. Petersburg development. What you're looking at right there is the Sunshine Skyway. And sitting here in Peoria, Illinois, I'm thinking I'd like to be traveling north over that Sunshine Skyway about right now to head into downtown St. Pete. But just a beautiful downtown that we'll get some more shots of later. I do want to point out that the address for both of these parcels that we are developing is right here on the bottom left hand corner of your screen. If you want to jot those down and Google map it or take a look. Uh, at your convenience, that would be awesome. Who we are. This is probably best left to Robert to talk about what is the heartbeat of REM. Robert? Yeah, I'll jump in on that one. And by the way, <clears throat> excuse me, before I forget, um, for those of you who may be new to this platform, because we haven't used Livestorm that much, there's a couple of different sections on your screen. One is a, a questions tab and the other one's a a, a chat tab. So if you can try to use the questions tab for your questions <laughs> and then the chat tab, if you've got any technical issues or something like that, feel free to jump in the chat. But the questions is kind of what we like to focus on because it helps us stay organized. And then that way we make sure we answer your question. We can, there's a little, there's a, there's a notation on the screen on our end where we can say, okay, we answer that question and it just helps us keep track of it. So um, just a little housekeeping there. And um, Adam will be the one to to moderate this question. So if you say nice things, he'll put your question on. No, I'm just kidding. So try to stump him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Try to stump him. Yeah, so for sure. anyway, but without further ado, yes. So REM, we are vertically integrated. Um, we have been uh, in business now for just over five years, started the company. And we did our first deal back in 2018. We've got 24 properties currently, about a half a billion under management, and we've got 130, 140 people on the payroll doing management, construction, renovation, um, you name it, we do it. And so we're kind of the old school real estate company and uh, obviously value that integrated approach to investing as well. So that's a little bit about us. And, and we actually just hired a COO last week. Um, so we're excited, you know, building the team out really trying to build the bench so that we've got that expertise and um, experience that we can bring to the table for you guys with each of these deals. So, uh, And Robert, yeah, if I may, from my position as having been an investor with REM for a long time, what I see in REM is I see uh, an operator who will tell me the truth every time, good, bad, or ugly. And, and I think it's that level of integrity that, that shows through in the day-to-day -day interactions and just the truth telling that really drew me personally to REM, both as an investor and now as a partner as well. So first of all, thank you for that. And thank you for your integrity in those things. You bet. 
Uh, we'll get the boring stuff out of the way now with our disclaimer. This is a uh, 506C syndication for accredited investors only. I do want to make a quick point here. If you're a non-accredited investor and you're on this call or maybe watching this webinar, welcome. We're thrilled to have you. We hope that this is educational for you. We hope you can learn a few things. Please reach out with questions to us. We to guide you to the point of getting accredited. You can be involved with us. But this particular investment requires that accreditation and it will require verification based on the SEC's regulations. We'll also be making forward-looking statements tonight that are projections and not guarantees. So keep that in mind as a disclaimer as well. Robert, anything you want to add on the disclaimer? Yeah, I think the only guarantees are from Nate guaranteeing that our costs are going to go down 10% between. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Welcome no, to the good. show, Nate. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> no <Yeah>. pressure. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So next, I, I just want to spend a minute or two talking about risk-based investing. I've talked to probably 30 or 40 of you this week, uh, specifically about development versus value add. And when I think about risk, I think about something that you can never actually fully get rid of. And there are so many different ways that we can think about risk. But what this is really about is understanding what those risks are on the front end and mitigating them as best as you can and then also being fairly compensated for the risks that we do take. So if we might look at a value add deal as a three or four out of 10 on the risk spectrum and look at returns that might be in the 15 to 16, 17, 18% range on an annualized basis, well, then we should be compensated for taking a slightly higher risk in development. So we really look at this type of uh, a deal as maybe a five out of 10 on the risk spectrum. We really want to be positioned as a company who takes measured risk, but is compensated solidly and really well for the amount of risk that we will take. So I think there's really five specific parameters that it makes sense uh, to think about on the risk spectrum as we look at this. The first being stress testing, which is what are we looking at in our underwriting? Because much of this business is predicting the future. And as everyone knows, predicting the future is a fool's errand. Hmm. So what are we stress testing to make sure that if rates go to X or if rents go to Y or W, then how durable is this investment against this stress? That's the first thing that we're looking at. The second one is identifying risks. Those risks may be market-based. They may be weather-based. They may be cost-based. They may be uh, GC-based. They may be subs-based. There's so many other ones, but it's how many of those risk can you correctly identify on the front end and then mitigate them? The third one, and this is near and dear to my heart as I am a bottom-up value investor through and through, is lower leverage. And I think one of the things about REM that stands out from just about every other syndicator out there is we use less leverage. On average, across the board, no matter how you look at it, we're looking at less leverage. That makes our investments much more durable across market cycles. The next is Industry experts. We want to be the experts in our field. We want to partner with the experts in our field. We want to know everything we can possibly know about each and every deal that we do. Just a quick note on that. This property is, what, Robert, 20 minutes from your doorstep? About 35, but it's close. Yep. Uh, apparently, when I was there a few weeks ago, I drove a little too fast. <laughs> so, yeah, well, not real you far. know, you were in a hurry to get to the airport, probably. No. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. One way or the other. And finally, it's conservative underwriting. It's things like uh, profiling an exit cap that is higher, or sorry, a, a higher cap rate than what it is today, meaning that it's worth less than we think it is today based on a cap rate. It's stuff like underwriting $2,000 per door insurance, going up 10% per year, when the reality is our insurance might be eight or 900 or $1,000. That's the conservative underwriting that goes all the way back full circle to that stress testing and understanding what will happen in a market condition that we're not really excited about. Robert, anything else you want to add on the risk side? No, I think that's great. Appreciate it. Great synopsis. Yeah, absolutely. Here's just a brief table of contents, guys, just to know, let you know where we're going. And if you want to skip back and forth, once we're done, you're watching the replay, you'll be able to take a quick look here at where we're going to head tonight. The executive summary starting here, Again, St. Petersburg, downtown. We are super excited about the location. It really, it's pretty close to ideal from that standpoint as we look at it. 
But Robert, I'd like you to jump in here on the property story because I, I was listening to you talk about this uh, last week and there's so much here to touch on. We, we look at employment and it's just exploding in St. Pete, which is so exciting. We look at the rents of where they have been. Uh, just the tiny little bullet point down there. The studio rents are 11% increase year over year since 2018, 11%. So when you look at this uh, slide, Robert, what is this saying to you? Well, I think there's a couple of things that are major points here. Um, and again, for those of you who have a limited amount of time, we've got an executive summary here. We're going to try to keep it to 15 minutes and then we'll go into the details. So hang tight if you got to run tonight. Um, however, I will say this before I forget too. At the end of this, we're going to try to carve out 10 to 15 minutes. We've got our asset positioning study back. So we always hire a company to come in, analyze the market. Not that we don't know what we're doing, but we get a third party to come in and confirm the assumptions that we made about the market. And they've provided us with 10 different names. And we'd like to have a little fun, get a poll going, see what you guys think. Um, we may or may not choose it. Depends. No, I'm just kidding. But we'd like to do a poll. So we're going to do it at the end, kind of give you a little bit of background there. So if you can stick around, do that. Um, but back to Isaac, what you were saying about the uh, property story here. So I think the really powerful uh, commentary on St. Pete really is based around the strength of the market. The uh, multifamily market in St. Pete and Tampa Bay in general hasn't, hasn't been touched through COVID. In fact, it's gone up quite a bit. And there was a study that I actually sent out this week on my CEO blog showing how prices in the East Coast, and particularly in Florida, have gone up 10 to 15% over the last year, while prices mm. on the West Coast have gone down 10 to 15%. So again, we're seeing a continued positive trend in Florida, population growth, job growth, et cetera. I think it has a little bit of something to do with the pro-business approach that many states on this side of the country have. I'm not going to get into politics there, but I think it's <laughs> it's benefiting the overall picture. So that's really part of the story here. The other thing is that St. Pete is a little bit of a unique market. And this is what I'm really excited about. You know, you've got Miami on the Southeast coast, obviously you've got all the excitement and the, the, the sort of panache that goes with Miami. We don't really have something like that on the West coast per se, mm. except I feel like St. Pete is the closest to that. Now Sarasota is also a really uh, good market too, which is coming up a lot. Hoping to have a couple of deals down there in the next few years that we can bring to you guys. But St. Pete has that really beautiful downtown, the vibe, the energy, the food, the art, the music, all the all the kind of events that you like to see in a city like this. Plus, you've got the good weather. So again, that really ties in well to our business plan, our thesis around people wanting to be here. A lot of folks that are working remote that are moving to St. Pete. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, too, in terms of the unit mix that we're proposing for this project, because I've had a lot of people come to me and say, you know, I don't really understand why you guys are doing all these studios. Don't people need two beds? Well, people love two beds from a conceptual standpoint, but they're not really wanting to pay thirty five hundred dollars to four thousand or more per unit. So, again, we're we're positioning ourselves in a niche market that's underserved in the St. Pete area. And so we're trying to get these people in that uh, would not be able to otherwise afford downtown St. Pete address, want to be there, have the capability to be there. Um, and again, you know, you have to remember, too, this is an environment where people are not living in their units. They are there, but they're experiencing the outdoors, they're experiencing the community around them more often than they are in their units. Now, of course, you know, you've got your remote work folks that want to have a place to have their computer and their desk and, you know, a nice view. But overall, people are looking for that value. And so that's kind of the, the, the two main points here that we're targeting is great growth in the market. St. Pete's an awesome place to be. But then there's this niche underserved market for these smaller units and really a lower price point that provides value for the, for the residents. So go ahead, Isaac. That's, yeah, that's great, Robert. And I think that there's a slide later that we'll look at that talks about the employers in the area. And there's mm -hmm. a very specific point that I think we need to make there about why specifically young professionals will be looking for this type of, uh, you know, this type of studio one bedroom type property right downtown in St. Pete. So we'll touch on that a little bit more later sure. as well. Financing. We talked about this in the risk based side, but we want to really dig in here on what this financing looks like. We have obviously seen a lot of things in the news about uh, various banks 
uh, going under because of poor balance sheet management, which I think is something that's very important to note is that they were not managing their balance sheets correctly, which is one of the reasons that we love conservatively underwriting and stress testing. But another point that I think we should make is we've actually seen rate stabilization. If you go back and look at the five-year treasury uh, on June 30th of last year, the, the five-year treasury is exactly where it was today. So there's a lot more stabilization in rates than people might imagine. Now, that probably doesn't even matter too much on this deal because of the way that we have underwritten the deal. But as we look at this and go through it, just a couple of, of high points here. We have flexibility with our loan terms, modeling 75% loan to cost. We have a plan to refinance into agency debt upon stabilization of the property. Sta uh, agency debt, what is that? Fannie, Freddie, HUD. All the low fixed long-term loans are federally backed. Once stabilized, and this is a very important number to remember, our effective leverage will be 45% loan to value. Robert, can you touch on that number and just what that means to a project like this from a risk standpoint? Absolutely. I think the nice part about that is that is what I would call a stress test. So worst case, let's just say we are not able to take any money out of the deal. We just need to refinance the construction loan. Well, if you look at the value of the property, once it's stabilized versus that construction loan, it's about 50% of the value. And that's where you want to be. Great. So at the end of the day, we're looking at a $120 million project from a value standpoint that we're going to build for $60 million all in. Rough numbers. And that's the, kind of, that's the kind of deal that you want to be involved in when you're doing development because it gives you some flexibility. The other thing I want to point out, there's a bullet point down below to this point too, but we've got a structure or a stress test in place right now where let's just say that interest rates don't move between now and two, three years. Um, that's actually the way we underwrote this deal. So the existing 10-year uh, Fannie Freddie note that you can get right now today with the interest rates where they're at is what we underwrote. Now, I think if I took a poll here tonight and I asked everybody, hey, in two or three years, do you think interest rates are going to be higher or lower? I'm betting most people are going to say, I think they're going to be lower. Inflation's going to be gone. The economy is going to come back, whatever. So again, we're being conservative about that and saying, what if we have to refinance this just as it is today? Nothing's changed. Let's make sure that deal still pencils. So just kind of a side note there as well. Yeah, that's a, a great point. I would be in the camp of saying I think rates will be either where they're at or a little bit lower as well. However, you know, knowing that we have that flexibility if they do continue uh, raising rates is it helps me sleep at night. But again, we want to come back to the conservativeness of the underwriting here. We're assuming in this that we will uh, refinance or dispose, which we don't think we ever want to sell this property. This is premium property, a durable asset. But theoretically, if we're putting together a pro forma, right, we're assuming a 20, per, uh, 20 basis point, that's two tenths of a percent increase each year in the cap rate. That means we are projecting it to be worth less based on the market than it is today in our underwriting. Again, that just comes back to conservative nature on it. We're also modeling a conservative 18 month lease up period. So 18 months for construction, 18 months for lease up, 36 total months. In this market, bringing an A-class brand new product at the lowest or very near the lowest price point, we think 18 months is also conservative. So you're going to hear me say that word probably too many times tonight, mm -hmm. but this is what we're doing to try to mitigate the risk for you uh, the investor, also for us as the general partners as well. We haven't noticed noted this yet, but uh, Robert has secured this land uh, five to seven million dollars under market price. That's a ten percent savings across the whole project, just in the land acquisition price. So there's built-in equity just in the bare land as it sits today. Uh, also, we should know. I'm sure this gets noted on every webcast that you see from REM, but in-house um, construction and project management for tighter oversight and better controls. It's all just trying to get you the best value investment for your dollars. Yeah. And I'll add to that too. Um, this is why we don't like working with national builders. This is why I really enjoy working with somebody like Nate, a local uh, you know, guy that knows what he's doing, cares about the project, has a reputation like we do and is is you know financially incentivized not just from a fee standpoint but really wanting to partner on this and i think that's important i feel like it's important that all of our projects have kind of the key principles aligned in the same direction 
Um, cause some people ask me say, you know, why don't you just use a national builder and just, you know, kick it out the door. That's not really who we are. Um, we're not the gray stones and the, you know, those kind of guys, we like to do niche projects. We like to do boutique quality. And, um, you know, the only way to do that is if you've really got a team of experts working together. So. That's great. And we'll get an opportunity to actually look at, uh, three of Nate's projects later in this deck, which incredibly impressive, Nate. I, I didn't get to tell you that offline yet, but man, you've got some awesome stuff out there. Just to yeah. hit the high points here uh, from an investment standpoint, for those of you that have never done a development deal with REM, some of these numbers might pop off the page. They do for me because we're talking about a preferred return of 15%. That is cumulative each year, not compounding, but cumulative, meaning if this is a three-year project in the development phase, you have a 45% preferred hurdle before REM makes any money at all. And so if you're used to the value add deals at 8%, this is nearly double the hurdle for REM to make any money. That means we are highly motivated to get this right, to get you your pref before anything comes back into Robert's pocket. So I think that is something to really consider when we look back at the risk-based slide that we talked about, a little bit more risk, moderate risk, but a really solid return. Projected equity multiple 2x in two to four years, based on what we talked about previously on the timeline, and a projected IRR of 25 to 30%. Robert, anything you want to add there? No, that's perfect. Yep. Phase two. We've had a lot of questions about this. And as a value investor myself, this is the thing that I am most excited about. Because if I if I were thinking about, okay, I'm going to go make this investment. REM is going to execute on this business plan. And in say 30 months, I'm going to take my money back out and, and be down the road. There's a couple of things there that I have to consider. Taxes for one. And two, I have to go find another place for that money when reality is I want to invest in downtown St. Pete. And so we are opening up the opportunity for every investor that if you would like to take your gains from the first phase of this, which is the development phase, and roll those into the stabilization phase, we're putting the same terms as we typically do on the value add for phase two. So let's say theoretically that you put $200,000 into the development phase, and that turns into $400,000 at the end of you know, two and a half, three years. That means that you will then roll into an 8% preferred return scenario with the same splits that you're already used to, and your cash on cash from your Starting investment is probably going to look like 15 to 20%. That means a $2,000 or a $200,000 investment is going to turn into thirty dollars to $40,000 of yearly cash flow in a property like this in downtown St. Pete. That's a projected IRR in phase two, not to be confused with the development phase, of 15% as well continually. And it's really heavy on the cash side, which speaks to me well. Robert, anything there that I left out that you'd like to touch on? No, that was great. I think, you know, the the key that you touched on was the tax savings at the end of the day. Uh, the beauty yep. of this is that you can put your investment in, double the money, roll it tax free and then get cash on cash return. Plus, we're going to do a refinance with most likely a good chunk of that money coming back. So it's kind of a win win. You're able to to get the returns on the increased uh, basis and still get some of that capital back. So kind of a win win. And you're left with a nice chunk of a class A asset in a phenomenal market. So. Absolutely. And I think it's important to note, though, let's say you get two and a half years down the line and, and you've got a wedding to pay for or college or something like that. You have the, the right to take your money out and go if you would like. So we wanted sure. to give people the right, but not the obligation to join us in phase two, because we do anticipate holding this property for the long term. Yep. Meet the team. We finally get to really properly introduce... Nate as well. So as you guys already know, REM Capital, over half a billion under management, uh, 4,000 units as well, uh, about a quarter billion in the development business as well. But let's focus on Nate here. So finish line builders. And, and Nate, I really want to hear from you. I see a quarter billion develops 20 years of experience, but tell us who you are, Nate. What, what gets you out of bed in the morning? So um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we got gotcha. you. Yeah, perfect. Um, started out my career. Uh, my grandfather was a general contractor, been around it my whole life and uh, started out commercial construction for a national builder. 
um, worked in the multifamily sector, condominiums, and self-storage throughout the country, and involved from a superintendent, the project manager, um, moved up through senior project management, and eventually it was kind of time to step out on my own. Started Finish Line Builders, and we've developed um, self-storage projects, multifamily, hotels. I did the A-loft in downtown Tampa, um, the Edge on Clearwater Beach, and uh, I work for Extra Space Public Storage. Previously, where I was, you know, kind of a, a merchant builder, general contractor, and since then, uh, in the last seven years, started doing projects where I was the development side, um, you know, getting all the use approvals, finding the land deals, construction, and and so on through operation. Um, so Finish Line Builders is a local Sarasota general contractor focusing on commercial construction, but we have had a national presence and uh, very, very adept to, to this market. Um, know St. Pete very well, have very strong relationships with subcontractors, knowing um, building code inspectors, third party. So we're, we're very comfortable in this area, in this arena. Yeah, and having those is uh, pretty important, that's for sure. <laughs> it, it's everything, isn't it? It's everything in this business. It, it, you're a, a very humble guy, Nate. I heard a rumor that there may have been a record broken on a dollars per square foot basis sold. Is that, uh, am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, so the Soleil apartment project that you have up on the screen, we ended up uh, developing in downtown Sarasota market and uh, sold that for $500,000 a unit. And it was one and two bedroom units because typically you could see larger numbers like that on a three bedroom or larger type unit mix. It was a smaller type unit mix, kind of what we're seeing here in these St. Pete projects. And we set a uh, you know an all time record for Florida per door on the West coast of Florida at that time. So it was definitely a, uh, a good project. Just a little bit of context there, over $500,000 per unit. This project that we're talking about in downtown St. Pete, we're coming in just under $270,000 per unit. So we're just over half the cost as what Nate's talking about, what he developed over there in Sarasota, Sarasota just right next door. So a little bit of context to add to really how phenomenal that is on a dollars per door basis. Good well, basis. I, it's amazing. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. And, and these places... Nate, just great job. I, congratulations. These are just phenomenal looking buildings. Thanks. Appreciate you guys it. Are, you guys are down here for vacation. Now you know where to go. Check out the <laughs> Eloft and the Edge. <laughs> well, one unique thing is that Edge Hotel, um, to kind of bring it all together, the Edge Hotel, the architectural group that we have on these apartments, designed that project, the Edge Hotel. So it's a longstanding relationship right. with that architect, and they specialize in this type of multi-family hospitality industry. So it's a very, very vetted team all the way through design. How many units is that hotel, Nate? Uh, it's 200, but there's communicating doors. It was roughly uh, like 580,000 square feet. Outstanding. So nice hotel That's right beautiful. on the water on Clearwater Beach. I'm gonna check that out next time I'm down there. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll pipe into what Nate said about the architect. So um, yeah, we've got a few different projects going on around the country, different architects, and it is, really really important that your drawings are good if you have bad drawings you can literally spend millions of dollars trying to re-engineer things on the fly so having a good team in place is extremely valuable when it comes to trying to get these projects done on time in budget and without too much of a headache so uh, i just want to underscore that importance for those of you that are kind of newer to the development space it you know these buildings don't just kind of and i'm not saying this sort of uh, trying to be a jerk, but you know, these buildings don't just pop out of the ground. There's a mm. lot of stuff that goes into them. <laughs> so no doubt about it. That's yeah, that's a great point, Robert. Absolutely. Nate, thanks again for being with us. I, I'm extremely impressed by your work and I hope to get to see him in person sometime soon. Thank you. Appreciate that. By the way, speaking of uh, in person, we are going to have a groundbreaking down here. So hopefully uh, all of us will be there and we're going to invite some of you folks, investors, to join us. And I was joking with, I think I was joking with Adam earlier today or, or one of the guys, and I said, when we do our groundbreaking, we are not going to have a pre-dug pile of dirt. Um, <laughs> you're going to actually have to break the ground. And if you don't, we're going to make fun of you. 
but it's going to be fun because it's actually going to take a little effort. You know, there's going to be real shovels with some real dirt that you have to move. So get ready. We're going to make you work if you come down for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring my gloves then, Robert. That sounds yeah, like Yeah, there fun. you go. That's right. That's good. I'm looking for any excuse to get out of March, Illinois weather. So I'll come shovel, you know, holes for you all day long. No problem. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> Nate will hire you all day. You can work the bucket truck. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm pretty soft. You probably wouldn't hire me. We'll see. Uh, I'll, I'll just breeze through this really quickly on the business plan, guys. We're taking the existing raw land, of which there's a couple of abandoned structures on now, raising those structures. The permitting and zoning process is complete. I would call this project shovel ready. Um, groundbreaking. We're estimating starting this as quickly as possible. It is ready to go. The second that we have funds availability, we will be breaking ground. Stabilization. I think this question gets asked a lot. We view stabilization as uh, 90% occupancy, and we've already touched on this once or twice. 36 months is what we have underwritten, but we do think that this would stabilize more quickly than that. So you know that on paper, uh, we're doing the right thing in case it does take longer for any reason, but we think we'll get there a fair bit quicker than that. And, of course, uh, we want- Isaac, real quick before you go on. So just a quick note, guys, you know, our initial uh, webinar that we did, we were anticipating to break ground April 1st. We're a little bit behind that schedule currently. Part of that is it took us a little bit longer to get these bids in. Um, Nate, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, just in terms of kind of why it was important to take a little more time to get all the numbers put together. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So part of, um, I guess, the market that we've been in over the last two years is it's been interesting in Florida, especially development has been rampant. Their subcontractor pool hasn't increased, it's it's decreased. They've gone to other areas. So there's been a lot of challenges when it comes to making sure you have qualified subcontractors, the right amount of manpower, and that a project can be built as planned. So our discussions in this project were we I had a target base of subcontractors that we wanted to go out and request proposals from that we'd like to um, have as part of the team. So some of those subcontractors, based on their workflow, we needed to make sure that they had the availability to man this project once if we were to go forward with them and that they could bid the project and give us accurate, you know, a good bid, not that they're extremely busy and that the number's not accurate. So it, it was it was massaging and going through and figuring you know, the, do we have coverage from the right subcontractors to put a accurate schedule of values together? So in the process of bidding the job, it was very different than other projects in the past where you could send it out to your subs and they give you back numbers and we could rely on, you know, historical data. This took a lot more of an interview type process where we had to sit down with the subcontractors, break down what jobs they're doing, what kind of manpower they could allocate to this. Um, is this something that fits for them? And, and making sure that there was yeses, that if, you know, and, and we have a very solid team. Um, if I have a moment, I'd like to talk about, you know, uh, there's auger cast pilings on this job. We have um, Keller North American. They're the largest uh, pile contractor in the country building a building like this, you want to make sure the foundation is solid. So, you know, starting out from the ground up, we've assembled a team through the schedule of values of very competent, very um, qualified subcontractors for a high level of success. So we've gone with them, discussed manpower, timing of the job, and making sure that we have all of our bases covered for a very successful project. And, um, as we go further, and if somebody would like to know, we, we have a, the, the, the team that at this point has created the schedule of values yeah. for the project and the bid, they're all very qualified subcontractors that have manpower and that we have a, a, a high level of um, success in other projects with them. So the team is, is very vetted. Thanks, Nate. Appreciate it. Yeah, I think it's just you know, important. I want everybody to understand that sometimes it takes a little bit longer but especially in today's market, it is extremely critical to make sure that the team that's that's put together is the right team, not just a team, but the right team. And like you said, they've got the manpower, they've got the time, the schedule works, the fit works. Um, yeah, we don't want to be halfway through and then all of a sudden somebody's like, yeah, hey, yeah, you know, I don't think this works for me anymore. <laughs> and that's a bad day. So 
Um, and it and it's partly too because with the market where it's at, there's a lot going on. And so like I'm doing a, a small project on a personal level and, you know, you can't even get concrete for a month and a half. It's ridiculous. So there's just a lot of supply chain issues in the business that, you know, when you do a $60 million project like this, you don't want to have that holding up a $60 million deal for weeks on end because, you know, somebody backed out. So thanks for that background, Nate. I just uh, felt Thank like you. that was important to kind of explain to everybody sort of why why the schedules change a little bit. Now, I know we talked about, you know, trying to get out of the ground before rainy season. Um, how do you feel about that at this point? Are we still within, you know, range? I mean, I feel like we are, but you tell me. So all permits are in hand. Um, the project is completely ready to go. Uh, subcontractors are teed up. Uh, we'd go through the shop drawing process. So we're, we are at the point to break ground. I mean, we could break ground the next two weeks. Great. Perfect. All right, good. Sorry, Isaac. No, that's fantastic. Nate, thanks so much for all the color. That was really helpful. Uh, just finalizing out this, I, I think I've already touched on this, but cash out refinance will come upon stabilization to agency debt. That's when we'll transition into phase two for long-term cash flow. As we look we at this $42 million construction project, that's the zero to 18 months that I touched on earlier. That is what we're calling the development project. After that would be the stabilization to refinance, 18 to 36 months for lease up and stabilizing the property as we look at that. Robert already touched on kind of finishing slab construction before hurricane season, Robert and Nate. So thank you for that. That's awesome. Anything else that you'd like to add here, Robert? Nope. It's uh, pretty self-explanatory. And of course, we went through, we went through this on the previous uh, webinar too, but same schedule as far as that goes. Yeah, great. And if anybody wants access to that previous webinar, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to send it to you as well. Rent comps. I think we already touched on this a little bit, but this tells a pretty powerful story. So I really just want to dive in here for a second because sitting where I'm at in Peoria, Illinois, and you start talking about a studio at 1800 bucks a month, you're like, wait, what? What's happening here? But then you go look at comps and comps are almost uniformly above $2,000. In fact, approaching $2,400. So we're bringing brand new product to the market in a premium location. This is just for the record. I have to say this. This is just a, a few blocks from Tropicana Field where the Tampa Rays play. Opening day is tomorrow. So super excited. It's going to be going to be fun. And this is the perfect location to be able to walk to a baseball game as well. So that's anyway, true. Back now, now, Isaac, just a little bit of bad news for you. They're tearing that thing down and they're going to completely redevelop the entire block. Well, blocks. So I know. Yeah, just, I know. You know, now I think that's good news for the town because I think it's going to bring a tremendous amount of velocity from a just a, a growth and, and uh, dollar standpoint. But yeah, there, there's a limited number of baseball games left. <laughs> <laughs> the good news is, is there's usually plenty of seats available in the trap for those limited oh, yes. games that you have. So you'll be oh, able yeah. to get a nice cheap ticket to go to those games. Very true. Yep. Uh, but just taking a look at these comps, guys, we're, we're just about $1,800 in our underwriting for what these are looking at, where the competition is generally a, above 2000 as well. So we're coming in at a similar rent per square foot. Another thing to note here is that these are 2023 and, and actually probably more like 2022 comps where we're looking at putting people in this in 2025. And this being an area that's growing five, four, five, six, seven percent per year, we're basing that on today's rates, not 2025 rates. So we think we'll be extremely competitive on that standpoint from the studios. Actually, not a seven percent per year. E 11, one, one on the studios. Yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah. again, we're, we're projecting no rent growth between now and when we come to the market, uh, it, again, there's upside here. I'm, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to set our expectations, but there's upside here. And that's, that's the goal. You know, I, I think if I say conservative 82 times in this presentation, you're allowed <laughs> to say upside once you get one, right? <laughs> good enough. Good enough. So then if you take a look at sort of the small one bedrooms, uh, you know, if we're looking at uh, 2,200, again, average being almost 2,500, we're coming in below before you think about any growth. And then on the larger one bedrooms where we're coming in at 824 square feet, we're actually above average in size on what's considered a large one bedroom. Um, you know, we're right at that average for what today is before considering any growth. So 
we feel really good about that. We feel really good about being able to bring this area a more affordable option than what is currently out there. The other thing is, is these properties will be five, six years old by the time this comes to market, these comps, and this will be brand new, sparkling, brand new amenities. Everything will be clean. So it'll look yeah. pretty different to those other options. I'm going to throw one other thing out there. Please. Uh, I don't, I don't want to necessarily brag on us too much because we are relatively new to the development space, but I believe that our interior uh, decoration, for lack of a better term, design, whatever, I think it's going to be unique in the market. I've seen a lot of these products that try to be really trendy and modern, and I think they missed the mark, and I don't think they look good a year or two later. That's one thing that I think REM is going to be. I'm not saying we're the only company that does this, but there are very few companies, in my opinion, that really hit that balance between the modern the timeless, the unique, the, the, you know, give me some color, but don't give me too much. Don't give me, you know, drab, boring, give me a little bit of something. That's really something that we strive for. And I think that's going to be a value proposition in the market too, for our residents. We want them to walk away and say, you know, I really like that. There, there's something about that place that stuck out. Um, combine that with some really top notch, you know, resident experience. And I think we're going to be in a great spot. So not to belabor the point, but I think that also plays into this rent comp. So, well, you, yeah, you used a word there, Robert, that I think makes a lot of sense, which is timeless, because I go into a ton of these buildings and they'll do something uber modern that six months, even a year down the road just looks totally grotesque. And so I think having something that's tasteful and timeless makes a lot of sense for it to age well. Yep. Yep. So very good. Location and market. As I mentioned earlier, Robert is just a hop and a skip from this location. So I don't know if there's somebody better positioned to really know and understand this market than Robert currently is. Um, but why Florida? We talked about it earlier. No secret whatsoever that Florida has been a benefactor of everything that changed with COVID. They've also been a benefactor from some higher tax rates and some things that people don't like that are happening in some other states. So the net migration there has been strong. You also look at unemployment well under 3%. Uh, it, is, it is getting better and better and better. And it's the fastest growing state since 1957. So this is a trend that I actually think it's still in its early days. I, I, I think that this is an accelerating trend. Now I'm predicting the future again, and that always gets me in trouble. But I don't think this is a trend that's ending. I think it's a trend that is accelerating. Um, and then, of course, Florida ranks number one in the nation for attracting and developing skilled workforce. We'll, we'll put a pin in that one because I want to talk about the workforce a little bit later. I think there's a really important point that we should talk about. Robert, I heard you talking about this earlier, and I think this is a really salient point that you were discussing. This is an incredibly accessible location. Do you mind mm -hmm. touching on that briefly? <clears throat> yeah, it is. That's actually part of the reason that I think St. Pete has continued to grow so well, because you've got airports, you've got downtown, you've got the entire Tampa Bay area accessible. I mean, where we live in the Lakewood Ranch area, we're 35 minutes away. Um, Sarasota, Bradenton's 35 minutes south. Tampa's 35 minutes north. Three airports, you know, three large airports you can get access to. It's it's pretty cool. And then, of course, you got the beach on the other side of the peninsula. So, you know, you pretty much have it all. It's going to, you know, again, it's just going to continue to grow for obvious reasons. Yeah, outstanding. Thank you. This is a quick overhead look, and I would encourage you to as well get out your fancy Google uh, Earth view or streets and take a look at where this is at because we've superimposed the buildings on top of them. But that'll give you a really good idea of, of the walkable urbanism feel that we're looking at in this booming area as well. So I'll jump through that. But as I noted, the addresses of each of these locations, and they're about three blocks apart or so. Um, are, are both listed on that front screen. So uh, be sure to go back and look at that as you, um, maybe as you get done with this webinar tonight. Tampa Bay Economics. We can move somewhat quickly through this as we've talked about them. Number two location, uh, destination for relocation. Uh, top 10 best places to start a career. And it's probably quite a bit higher than top 10. And then this is the one that really jumped out to me. Tampa Bay region was ranked as the number one housing market for 2022 in the nation by zero uh, by Zillow. So at all of these stats, all of the dollar stats that we talk about, there's reasons for that. It's all about people flows. We don't Robert, want anything else there. 
stay home. Quit moving from <laughs> Illinois. No, I'm just kidding. Can you take two more, please? <laughs> no, that's all good. All good. All right. We're finally to the slide that I keep referencing. Pinellas County employers. You're going to see Raymond James, which is a very well-known financial institution investment advisor listed here with 4,000 plus employees. That, that's great. Why is this so impressive? Because it's only 4,000. I think the incredible thing about this is there is not one major driver of employment in this region. You've got a huge quantity of employment drivers, which is what? That's diversity. That's durability. That means that this is not reliant on one employer, that if something happens, that um, you know, you're going to have a huge washout. The largest employer is only a little over 4,000. Uh, Robert, your, your thoughts on the employment picture in uh, St. Pete, Tampa area? No, uh, I think you make a great point. <clears throat> and I think that's one of the reasons that it's resilient. Some people don't like that because they're like, well, we don't have, you know, 52 Fortune 500 company headquarters, blah, blah, blah. Hey, I'm fine if we don't have it, honestly. Um, brings me up to another point. I want to actually bring up this asset positioning report that we did. Um, so we actually hired a company called Uncommon. They do, and they're, they're you know, they're one of several, but they actually do research on markets. We hire them as a third party objective. They fly into town, research the place and research the comps and basically tell us what we already know. But the goal is, hey, it's a third party. So they're they're not looking at it through, you know, my lens of I've lived here for so many years. Nate's lived here, you know, whatever. Um, they went through and looked at it. The one thing I want to bring up here, because we don't have time to go through this entire entire um, uh, slide of this entire PDF, but the the kind of the demographic that they pulled back um, from this area, which we already knew, but again, I, I think it's important to see this. The typical type person that we're targeting is both younger and older. So you've got younger professionals coming into town. A lot of them work remote. So again, that's a target demographic. And then we have existing folks in the market who are younger that work for a company close by, Ray J, you know, Honeywell, whatever it is. Um, and then we have an older demographic of folks that are, uh, in fact, our research folks were kind of laughing. They said it's a lot of divorced people. Mm. So you have people that, you know, they're they're kind of at the at the sort of second half of their career. They don't have a family to worry about and they want to be in a place that's just fun. Great weather, easy to get a job, working remote, whatever. So those are really two primary demographics for the for the people that we're we're targeting. Um, which goes along with kind of the overall lifestyle here, the sociable, easygoing. And then um, what was the other thing I wanted to share here? Oh, here what, here's what it was. Yeah. So we kind of had these three profiles. So we got our native moguls, the younger folks stay in the area. 75% um, of renters. Don't be scared by the household income number of 32,000. That's always skewed because of national data. Um, but it's, it's a lot of renters and it's people that are here because they love the, the walking, the biking, the entertainment, the active lifestyle, that kind of thing. So that's going to be a big demographic for us. The second thing is the resident tourist, what we call them the resident tourists. This is people that move to St. Pete because they can work remote and they want to live where they vacation. Bottom line. It's, I mean, honestly, I would do the same thing. Well, I kind of do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's our, that's our second demographic. And then the third one is these, we call them boomerang locals. So basically people that, you know, they're, they're at the second half of their career, a lot of divorced folks, um, you know, maybe they have a significant other or whatnot. 86% of these folks are renters too. So those are kind of the three big demographics that we've broken out as part of this um, sort of this, this demographic study that we did. And those are the people that we're going to be targeting. So, and again, there's just, there's a lot of things that go into the, the back end of how do we market this? Who are we targeting? Why does the studio mix work? I can go on for hours and hours. You guys be bored in tears. <laughs> But I just want you to know that we don't just roll out of bed and be like, oh, yeah, we're just going to build this building and see what happens. Like there's a lot of thought that goes into it um, and and why it's going to work and why there's a market for it, et cetera. So let me uh, let me see if I can jump back here without too much too much drama to the other slide where we're we here. Still learning how to use this this uh, new presentation model here. That was pretty good, though. I'm impressed, Robert. You bounced, you bounced in and out pretty well there. <laughs> there we go. I'll that let you keep good. going. No, all good. 
a couple of stats here. You can see over on the right hand side, sort of just some spatial reasoning for downtown St. Pete and then how far out one, three, five miles is. I think that's really helpful to frame your mind around what we're doing. Median sales price, 390,000 uh, with about 62% home ownership. Here, I'm going to go predicting the future again, but if interest rates stay where they are, I believe strongly that that median home ownership is going to go down. If you look at the stats of large national home builders, single family home builders, they've had an enormous amount of cancellations based on interest rates going up. I believe that creates more demand for the things that we love, which is multifamily real estate. So I'm predicting, don't hold me to it, but that's kind of what I'm seeing there. Well. The good news, the good news is that either way, there's six and a half million units short of single family and close to three million units short of multifamily. So my thought is let the party keep going. We got a long way before we're going to run out of units. <laughs> uh, it's absolutely true. And a lot of the multifamily that is out there, you know, it's probably on its last legs as well. So there's a, mm. a shortage and I think it's, it's potentially getting worse. Yes, um, I agree. Average area rent, $3,200. Again, not to belabor the point, which you probably already have, but $1,800, $1,900 price point, way below your average area rent as well. Um, I, I want to point out one other thing on this slide before we move on. I've already talked about the market sale price earlier, but market cap rate, 4.3%. There's a certain part of me that says that's insane with where uh, <laughs> cap rates are. <laughs> We've seen bid-ask spreads in other areas tighten somewhat, not as much as they should, but tighten somewhat. In the Tampa St. Pete area, they haven't. You're seeing very little change in what that is. So when we look at a project like this that were pro forma six and a half to seven uh, cap rate stabilized, um, we're well over 200 basis points above what the steady cap rate is. And you're not talking about brand new apartments either in that case you're all, you're all talking one two three five years aged on that cap rate too so uh, right. this market has really been durable anything else there uh, that you're seeing on the ground robert well um i'm gonna kind of hurt our eyes here again and jump really quickly because i want to <laughs> i want to sorry um is this the slide wait a minute wait a minute where is it i thought i had it on here Oh, right after i complimented right. you my, my little screen was blocking yeah so if you look down at the bottom of this guys <laughs> You see where it says yield and then untrended yield on cost 6.8%. So in a development deal, the number that we look at is called yield on cost. Yield on cost basically says, okay, we're going to build this for 60 million bucks. At the end of the day, what is our stabilized NOI, our net operating income relative to that, that total cost? 6.8%. Now it's similar to a cap rate in the sense that, you know, if you buy a stabilized asset and you pay $20 million, you can get a $2 million NOI. That's a 10 cap. Not that we're buying 10 caps or anything, I wish, but you get the point. <laughs> so the key here is you want to have a yield on cost that is north of or in excess of the stabilized long-term debt product that's out there in the market. So right now, if you get a 10-year fixed rate note, it's call it 5.5% right now. Our yield on cost, assuming no rent increases and assuming that Nate does a phenomenal job and doesn't blow something out of the water or mess something up, which he won't. I'm just kidding. Um, but the point is, our model is showing a 6.8% yield, yield on cost. So we've got a nice delta between where we're going to be and where the market is today between that yield on cost and where the debt cost is. You want to see a positive spread there. That's important. Now, I also put down here the spread between the cap rate and our yield on cost, which is another 2.5%. Mm -hmm. So again, that's the kind of fudge factor that you want to see in your development deal. Again, there's always risk. There's lease up risk with development. We all understand that. But you want to see that kind of fudge factor because that's what gives you the ability to go back, do a refinance, take some capital off the table, get a nice cash on cash return at the end of the day. So I just wanted to kind of fast forward to this slide because it ties into the cap rate in the market versus our yield on costs. Most lenders in this market, they won't do a deal on a development side if it doesn't have at least a 6% yield on cost. That's kind of the baseline for folks. So again, we like to be six and a half or better. This fits into that category. And I think it's, you know, it's a good testament to, to where the numbers are shaking out. So um, and just a note, if I can add just on an educational basis there, Robert, I, 
In my opinion, the unlevered yield on cost, which is what this is, is the single most important metric in multifamily investing because there's a whole bunch of accounting things that you can do to play with IRRs or you can load up on debt and, and have way more risk in a deal than you should. And, and people won't talk about what their actual unlevered yield on cost is. That's what this number right here is showing, which at the end of the day removes all of the variables of debt, everything about interest rates and said, what are we yielding on the money that we're spending? True. And so I, I just think that that is something that you can take home tonight and say, unlevered yield on cost. Let's think about that in any deal with any operator that we look at. Agreed. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. All right. We'll go back here and spend two minutes on property details. And then we got to talk about financials too. <laughs> yes, absolutely. 220 units, 2025 target completion, just about 500 square foot. Again, two buildings. These are about three blocks from each other. So we'll be benefiting from scale. Hear that, Nate? We're benefiting from scale. <laughs> on always, property. always. Good, good. Good to hear. We'll remember that. Robert touched on this just a little bit earlier, but I think that what we're looking for here is a timeless interior design. One thing to keep in mind is when you have a 500 square foot, 500, 600, 700 square foot units, you need tall ceilings. You need nine foot ceilings. That makes it feel much more airy and large. This will have a great feel when they're walked into because of the tall ceilings. High end finishes, granite, quartz countertops, pendant lighting all of the amenities that you would expect from a brand new class A product in, a, in an awesome city like St. Pete, uh, automated mail package stations, EV charging stations, which are a must have in a, um, a market like this, bike parking, garage parking. It's going to be a rooftop pool. So when I come down and check the project out, I might spend an hour or two there, potentially, <laughs> maybe. Um, the gyms, everything that you need for uh, an A-class product in today's market. Robert, you, just, you're, uh, I'll add you're something real quick. This. Yeah. I'll add something real quick. Uh, we're not going to have waterfall granite like shown in that kitchen picture there. Maybe on the model unit, but don't get your hopes up. <laughs> Deals off. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I was looking at it. I was like, well, that's probably a little too high end <laughs> with the yeah, with a dual yeah. sink and a, you know, double oven. Yeah. We're not quite going that level. <laughs> Well, we'll challenge Nate on it and see what we can value in Yeah, right. Either, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll definitely right. be nice. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Unit mix. This is between the two buildings, ABC, A1, A2, A3 over there. 117 studios and 29 one-bedrooms in the first building. 65 studios and nine one-bedrooms in the second one. And this will give you an idea when you go back and look at it of the various unit sizes. This is everything that's driving the metrics on the earlier slides as well. So you can get a look at exactly where we're putting the rents there, what the rent per square foot is, and then the total square footage as well uh, for the project. Financials. Robert, we're here. This is your turn here. Yep. We're gonna pass this over to you and Nate for a, a discussion on exactly what we're looking at from a financial standpoint. You Thank you. Yeah, let me jump in here, guys. So again, we got our final numbers. So I want that was really the main reason to circle back and do this webinar so that we could show you exactly where we're at. At the end of the day, our numbers are pretty close to what we projected, plus or minus. Um, we've got some contingency in there. We've got some other things to, to play with, but basically we're fairly close to where we projected. So um, at the end of the day, we're 59 million. Our initial projection was like close to 59. So I'm calling it 60 million at the end of the day, just around numbers. But as you can see, it's roughly where we projected. And then from a detail standpoint, um, I broke this out just so if you want to see kind of the, the breakdown there, the time frame is the same. The overall cost is very similar. Um, the equity is about the same. We're putting 15 million in and the construction loan is going to, to uh, count the balance. And then our, and our projected returns are also very similar uh, from an IRR standpoint, from a year over year standpoint on what kind of uh, returns we're going to get. So again, not a whole lot changed. That's a good thing. And I just wanted to come back, show you guys the numbers, let you know we've got our firm numbers in hand so I can say, hey, these are good to go, plus or minus a few points, depending on where the market moves. I think we're going to be in good shape. Um, same thing with the operational pro forma. We haven't made any adjustments here. We've kept our conservative estimates. I think we actually have upside on our rents. Again, as I mentioned, we're not, um, you know, we're not at this point, we're not going into it, assuming that the rents are going to continue to increase. So we're, we're underwriting it at today's rent with no increase, even though for the last 10 years, we had 11% increase. And I know some of you guys are thinking, yeah, but rents are coming down, the economy's weak, da, da, da. 
well, it's actually not happening in Tampa Bay. So we truly are kind of taking that conservative approach, which is good. You know, we want to do that. Um, so before I get into the fun part, uh, Adam, let me kick it back to you. Do we have questions and maybe I can do a couple minutes of a, uh, you know, Q and a uh, questions for me, questions for Isaac, for Nate, anything there that you'd like to pull out for us? Yeah, actually, I've been uh, answering these questions as we went along. I I don't think that we really have anything that is pending um, that you didn't answer in this. A couple of uh, appointments after the call to talk uh, a little bit more about it. Great. Um, but most recent recent question was um, someone had noticed that there was a lot of permitting going on in St. Pete. So they were asking about uh, an overabundance of new units coming in the market. Yep. Well, and I can speak to that real quick. So there is, I'll just give an example. There's a project coming to right at right catty corner to us called Sky St. Pete, about 200 units going up for 94 million. At least that's the stated price, probably close to hundred million. So again, we are going to have competition in the market, no doubt, but we are, again, we're not competing against the average product in the market. We're not the, you know, uh, half a million dollar price or half a million dollar per unit price point. We are a boutique niche product. We are targeting a demographic who cares about value. Um, we are straddling between people that are coming into town who some of them, of course, are willing to pay the $4,000 a month. But then there's others that are coming into town saying, you know, I am coming from Peoria, Illinois. And wow, $2,000 a month, that's a big deal. So, you know, we're, we're, we're pulling in that demographic. We're also pulling in the existing folks that live here that have said, man, what the heck happened? I used to be able to pay 500 a month and now you want 4,000 to live in downtown St. Pete. This is my home. So again, we want to pull that demographic in too. So we're not trying to be the biggest, best with the, you know, the, the Olympic size pool that's 30 stories up and all that kind of good stuff. We're trying to be that boutique niche market where we can really um, target a specific demographic. And again, I, it's an underserved demographic. So I think it's going to bode very well for us. So Again, going back to the question about new inventory in the market. Yes, there's new inventory, but there are different types of new inventory. So I think it's important to break that out. Now, if we were coming into the market with $4,000 rents, ones and two beds, just like everybody else, okay, great. We're going to be out there, you know, floundering like everybody else. Although I don't think it's going to be that bad because if you look at the absorption in the market, it's it continues to be very strong. So I'm not really too worried about it, but I think we have an additional advantage in the sense that our product is is a little different so um all right a human, there's a human element to that too robert right it's it's also meeting people where they need to be which is an affordable place to live yeah you know, and, yeah, I, and i think that's really important to note is that people need places under two thousand dollars to live if they're going to go work downtown especially young people right that that may be just getting started in their career yep that is very true um, can i add one thing on that there's uh yeah. for, for new projects and new let's just say projects to the market, it, it takes a while. This project was started in 2018 to go through site plan approval, finding dirt and getting the, um, the approvals to build something like this. It, it's not a process that happens overnight. So if somebody were to start that process in St. Pete, we've got a four year head start on that and coming to the market. So it, it's very interesting to see that if there is other projects coming into the marketplace, where are they in their process? And, you know, compared, we are truly shovel ready in a very, very, um, and great location. So I just want to correct that. Yep, that's true. Well, and, and to your point, Nate, actually, I think it's, for me, it's important to kind of note that the redevelopment project of the TROP is the, the bids are going to be due, I think, 25, 26. So they won't be breaking ground for another one to two years after that. So it's kind of nice in my mind because we're going to be able to stabilize. We'll be good to go well before that project takes off. Of course, there's going to be stuff in between us, but I think we're, we've got a really nice window for getting this project stabilized. So, but thanks for that. All right. So I want to jump in and take a minute real quick here, have a little bit of fun and jump into this asset positioning and talk about the naming here. So love to get you guys feedback. Um, let me just jump in here real quick to, where am I? Okay, naming, yes. So I'll go over these names real quick 
and um, maybe Adam or Isaac, one of you guys can prepare the poll. That'd be awesome. Working on it. Yep, working awesome. on it. Sweet. Okay. So we've you got 10 different things in here. Yes. Did you say something? No. I was just saying Isaac beat me to it. Okay, got it. All right. So we got 10 different names in here. A um, couple different themes that we're talking about. Actually, I'll spend two minutes talking about themes. So we got a couple different themes here. One is a very colorful theme. There's a lot of art, cool stuff going on in in, Sarah, in uh, St. Pete. Um, this is a little too crazy for me, so we'll tone it down a little bit if we do this. But again, you know, it's a, it's a nice idea. Um, another version was sort of more of a traditional classical sort of Florida look. Again, this is all kind of the the design people that throw out these great ideas. <laughs> um, we literally just got this today. And I said, hey, send it over. Let me throw it on there and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have some fun with it. But let's jump into the names here um, because this is where it kind of gets fun. So we got our first name that they came up with. And, and let me give you a little background here. So the challenge with a multifamily project is that you want to look at the availability of a domain, availability of time, uh, trademarks, anybody else that's used this name anywhere in the country or locally. Um, so there's kind of different factors that, that play into this. Because some people have said, why don't you pick this name? And I said, look, you know, these guys do this for a living. Their job is to come up with a name that we can use in a domain in the, you know, in the market, Florida, Southeast, whatever, we're not going to have competition from, you know, lively of Sarasota. Oh, we're St. Pete. Okay. Well, that's confusing, you know? So there's some things that go into it. So, um, this is one of the names they came up with called the lively. I kind of thought it was cool, vibrant, energetic, um, reflective of the neighborhood that this is in. Um, another one that they came up with is the Florin. It's named after the gold coin of Florence. So kind of more of a sophistication, high end class type, type refined lifestyle, which I thought was kind of cool too. Um, another one was the Astrid, meaning divine strength, kind of has that more modern futuristic feel to it with the industrial aesthetic, um, which is something that we will try to include in, in some of this project too. And then we had another one called Ellington Place. So for those of you who are jazz aficionados, Duke Ellington, pretty famous jazz guy. Um, I like the sound of this. Uh, I thought it was kind of cool too. So Ellington Place. Um, another one they came up with is Calder, uh, named after a artist, Alexander Calder. Talks about kind of innovation and creativity, which is again, uh, somewhat in indicative of the neighborhood that we're in. And then there was some simpler ones. So Celeste, uh, I actually uh, was laughing at this one because when I was growing up, I had a book about an elephant in that was a French king or something like that. Anyway, whatever. And then Celeste was his queen and whatever. And I was kind of laughing. And I'm like, oh, this is funny how these these stories from your childhood come back. But anyway, Babar, it's got to be Babar, right? Babar, exactly. Yes, thank that's you. The one, right? Yeah. Hey, that's pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> um, so that's another name, Celeste. Another one, Tesoro, which we actually looked at for one of our other projects. I really like the name. Um, but, you know, it's kind of like figuring out if it works for this particular project. Um, another one they came up with, Cadence, kind of that harmony and balance community. Perfect place for people to have a well-rounded lifestyle. And then the last one was um, Soul Reserve, kind of more of that well-preserved vintage wine, complementing the community, the youthful, lively atmosphere, that kind of thing. Um, so, again, as we go through these, and this is where I'd love to get you guys feedback as we go through these, we're trying to think about, you know, what what's the demographic that we're trying to hit here? We're not trying to be the biggest, gaudiest product on the block. Um, we want to be high end. We want to be luxurious, but we want to hit that niche market. We want to be boutique. Um, so give us your thoughts. Uh, guys, I don't know if you had the poll ready, but I'd love to love to get some feedback here. I have sent the poll, so I okay. hope people can see it. On my end, it looks like you can. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's always fun to go through and do these. You know, I know that we we uh, you know we jump through this in like twenty seconds. It takes a little bit more time, but it's always fun to you know throw it out there and get some feedback. Um, pulling Ooh. all this together is you know it's it's amazing how it takes. Again, you could just throw a project together, but it, it, if you really do it right, it takes a lot of thought to kind of think through the name, the branding, the colors, the style. Um, really creating something that is, I would call. Um, I don't know if I would say that it's an art piece, but something that is is memorable. Um, that's something yeah. that I really feel strongly about with our product. And, uh, you know, we want something that 
that people remember. One of the other things that we're going to be doing is there's a lot of uh, artists in the St. Pete market, and we're going to be going around looking to see if we can essentially bring in a local artist to integrate some of their artwork into the into this project. Um, now, it may not work, you know, depending on who's available, who might want to do it. But uh, the marketing company suggested that. And I was actually thinking the same thing, you know, bring somebody in and actually have them do some artwork and feature their artwork in the in the uh, in these buildings. So, again, just a you know, a way to integrate the culture, the history, um, a little bit of local St. Pete so that it's not just boom, you know, here's another boring apartment complex that some developer threw up and, you know, not that we don't need a place to live, but, you know, give me something a little bit more. Give me something to really grab on and, and sort of talk about. And people really appreciate that. You know, they want to they want to say, hey, you know, I live at the Lively. It's, you know, got this artwork and local artists and we got pizza nights. And, you know, there's a there's a, a pet event every Friday. You know, it just this sense of community is something that people are really looking for these days. And that's part of what we're trying to create in each of these projects. So, well, the people are speaking, Robert and Ellington places for considering there's nine options, Ellington places, uh, well ahead of the pack with 40% no to the vote. Yeah. Okay. Good and to know. Lively's coming in second at 16. So those two are well ahead of everybody else. All right. Fun, fun. Well, we'll let you guys continue to take the poll. And, uh, in the meantime, Isaac, I'm going to flip back over to our, uh, our presentation and if you're having trouble it... finding the poll go to the bottom of the chat and there's tabs underneath there where you select polls you'll be able to see it there thank you adam appreciate it okay yeah all right I expect you. yeah i think we're just really close to finishing up we've already touched on most of these things timeline wise so uh funds due here would be april 15th we're ready to break ground um as soon as this closes ready to go so construction begins about may 1st um, we would target leasing beginning uh, early part of January with construction finishing sort of fall 2024 and looking at stabilization uh, about 12 months after that, uh, targeting a refinance in the spring of 2026 as well. That seems like a long way off, but it'll get here so fast. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's amazing. Three years ago, COVID had just started. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that seems like an eternity to me anyway. It's yeah. like, wow, three years ago, time flies. <laughs> it, it does. It's amazing how quickly it goes. Um, also, just want to let you know how to get in contact with us. For those of you that are existing investors, you can just jump right in your portal if you'd like to join us in this uh, development that we're working on here. So it'll show up St. Pete. You can just click on that, make your reservation as well. For those of you who may have more questions, please feel free to reach out to me or somebody else on the investor relations team, Isaac or Eric, if you don't want to hear from me, that's fine. They're great guys. You'll love talking to them. So all three of our calendar links are right in there as well. And if you're a first time investor, we'd be happy to help you walk through the steps of getting into our portal and getting invested with our EM capital. Guys, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Robert, Adam, Nate, any last words before we sign off for the night? Nice job, man. Appreciate it. Yes. Excellent job, Isaac. Appreciate everyone showing up tonight. Yeah, definitely. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And thank you, Nate. Special thanks to Nate for taking a couple hours out to join us tonight. We really appreciate you and I love your projects. So good. And we appreciate will, that. We'll keep everybody posted on groundbreaking because that's probably going to be our next big event. So we'll keep you posted on that. Hope you can make it. Uh, take a little break from the lovely weather up north for those of you that are up north. <laughs> and, um, you know, we'll have some fun in the sun. But uh, yes. And, and also too, Isaac, just uh, as you mentioned with contacting us, so questions that you want a timely response, please reach out to Isaac, Isaac Schaefer, Eric, not to say that I will not respond, but um, my email has gotten a little crazy over the last couple of years. So these guys are here to help and they are very knowledgeable. They know what they're doing. They know what's going on. So don't feel like you're getting you know, second rate information from them when you contact them. But I am always here. So again, feel free to contact me, Robert at REM Capital. Same thing with Adam, you know, if you want to reach out. Um, sometimes we're a little bit longer on the on the response time, but we're always here too. So anyway, thank you. Yep, we're here, we're here to serve you. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Have an awesome night. Good night.